Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. This is Tony Fergie. I want to take the time out to thank all my subscribers. The old ones, the new ones, the ones that just keeps coming back because you love what you hear and what you see. Now today, guys, I want you to watch this video. How is it that Jamaica is going to turn away the Haitians that are seeking asylum? But they didn't do the same for those of Israel. Hmm. You guys... Please watch this video and please comment below. Tell me what you guys think. Is Jamaica right or are they wrong? Are they worried about the influx of all these Haitians coming in? Or can they help who they can? Why would you send back 37 people if you know they're not going to a place that is safe? Anyways, guys, please watch the video and please comment and let me know what you guys think. All right, folks, so the government of Jamaica has denied asylum to the 37 Haitian migrants who arrived in Jamaica by boat in July last year. The Haitians were handed the rejection letters last Tuesday, February 27. Their attorney and founder of the Freedom Imaginaries Human Rights Group, um, Melanie Allain, will be appealing the government's decision. She's actually in Haiti right now and joins us uh, via Zoom to discuss the process. Good morning, uh, Melanie. How are you? Welcome to Smile. Good morning. I'm actually in Jamaica right now. Oh, you're actually oh. in Jamaica. All right. Well, that's good news. You should be in studio with us if you're actually in Jamaica. Um, <laughs> the government of Jamaica, do they not have the right to decide who comes to the country, who stays in the country, and who uh, doesn't stay in the country? Don't they have that right? So, yes, but remember, every decision that any state organ takes must be in strict adherence with, you know, the Constitution and the rule of law and with international law obligations. And those obligations are very clear when it comes to migrants seeking refuge at your shores. Um, and, and this might be taking it somewhere else, but you keep hearing about the um, drugs for guns and things coming from different countries. And, and some of the reasons given is because we think some of these people who come in might not be the, the kind of person, the kind of people we want in our country. Is, is, there, is that a, a good argument or no? Well, every country across the world will have to make decisions in times of crisis and intense security, um, intense and complex security issues. I mean, we have Israel with what they would say is, you know, they are taking actions in self-defense. Um, but in reality, they're, you know, killing babies. In Jamaica, we're saying that, you know, Haitians are coming to Jamaica and there's this concern about drugs for guns. But at the same time, every decision and every action must be in compliance with the Constitution. It must be in accordance with the rule of law. And so while I understand the security concerns, we have a Constitution and we have international law and all actions of the state must must comply with those laws. And so what I would say to the government is I think there is a solution where we can balance between security interests and, you know, the fundamental obligation to respect human rights and find a solution that does not compromise the Constitution and, and that does not erode the rule of law. Because once you start eroding the rule of law and the Constitution, it, it, you you are going down a path, a dangerous model of decision making that will have implications for all Jamaicans. Okay. The, many Jamaicans may not be familiar with the process of seeking asylum and how it works and how a government determines who it will grant asylum. Can, share with us a little bit about that. What ha, what is the Jamaican government or uh, describe that process? Process, pardon me, that the Jamaican government undertakes. So asylum in Jamaica is, is governed by a refugee, a refugee policy, a 2009 refugee policy, and that is grounded in the convention, the refugee convention. And what it says is that, you know, persons who are fleeing persecution have a right to seek asylum. And one of the most fundamental obligations is the prohibition of what you call refoulement. And that is when you, you send someone back to a place where they could face persecution. And so one of the most important things to do under this regime of refugee protection is to set up a procedure and a process whereby vulnerable migrants can access a refugee status determination procedure where their international protection needs are assessed and then and then addressed. But what's happening in Jamaica is that, you know, they're not getting access to a refugee status determination process. 
And the only group that has been able to access it so far, which is the 37 in, that you know have applied for asylum, they have been subjected to an asylum procedure that we are determining to be so so unfair as to be unlawful because it, it doesn't have basic procedural guarantees. Um, and then those procedural flaws expose applicants to involvement. And on what grounds are you uh, filing an appeal of the decision of the Jamaican government to not grant asylum to these 37 Haitians? Well, each case will turn on its own, you know, facts, and I don't want to get too much into the facts of each case. But, you know, we have to remember that these are applicants that didn't even have an opportunity to appear before the eligibility committee that was convened to consider their applications. These are applicants that received a decision letter that was not written in their native language and that in our view was not sufficiently reasoned in that it did not provide um, sufficient information and reasons as to why their claims were, were not accepted. Um, and these are applicants who you know, went through an interview process with immigration officials where they didn't even have an opportunity to fully express their stories. And so what we're seeing is an overwhelming record of non-transparent decision making and procedural flaws that in our view has, have compromised the integrity of the decision. So what were they told by the government? What were they told why uh, the government is saying you have to go back to Haiti? Well, these are very formulaic letters that are essentially the same, except what they did was they picked out, in, in one case I counted the words, they, they took out seven words that the applicant said in an interview and said, this was the basis for your asylum application. And then they said, violence in Haiti is concentrated in Port-au-Prince, therefore there's no for your claim. And so already we see that there's an issue because right now we have UN bodies saying that violence in Haiti is intensifying and expanding. You know, we have news reports, whether it's from CNN or human rights bodies like, you know, Human Rights Watch. We have so much information on what's happening in Haiti. And by all indication, it is catastrophic. It is escalating. It has been compared to war zones and armed conflicts. And so what I would say is that, you know, I understand the security concerns of the government, but as I, again, you know, we do have international law, we do have a constitution. And so let us engage together to find a solution because what I don't accept is this unilateral decision-making. You know, we have to have a conversation around this. In that there are laws and stuff. So um, is there a suggestion here, or maybe even more than a suggestion that the Jamaican government, they are breaking laws by not accepting them? And, and if so, can you tell me one or two or what they're doing that you think is, um, is against the law? Well, I've always been very clear in my articulation that, you know, I consider the government to be violating international law. Uh, and that would be the Refugee Convention, which prohibits refoulement, which is the return of persons to a place where they could face persecution. And one of the requirements, you know, that re that obligation entails a requirement to establish an effective asylum procedure, which, you know, is governed by procedural safeguards that would prevent refoulement. Um, contrary to that standard, what we have is an asylum procedure where the most basic requirements of due process and fairness have not been met. And so the applicants in the initial phases did not have access to legal representation. They don't have access to basic information about their case, such as the composition of the eligibility committee that reviewed their case and the recommendations that were made. They don't have access to their application documents. And so I am looking at decisions that I don't even know how to challenge because I don't know what the information was that informed the decision. And so I want to move now from international law to just bring it to our own constitution because our constitution is also very clear. Our constitution sets out certain due process guarantees which don't seek to, 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 to establish a specific outcome in every case. What it wants to do is establish a process and that's why we call it guarantees. And so even in this case, you know, Freedom Imaginaries isn't even saying uh, we want certain outcomes at this point. What we're saying is that we want a process. We want a process in which each applicant can have an individualized assessment of their case, um, grounded in facts and evidence, and grounded in the law. We just so happen to, to believe that when you add the evidence of what's happening in Haiti, 
with the legal requirements of asylum, you have an inevitable con conclusion that you simply cannot return Haitians to Haiti. And this is exactly what the United, United Nations has said in its non-return advisories. Allow me to play devil's advocate, but before, before I do, I hear you mentioning solutions. And I, I do suppose that based on what you've put forward that some of those solutions to this issue will come through the due process to which the, the Haitians um, are entitled under international law. Um, and we are also neighbors, really. But the, here's the devil's advocate question. Does this not open the door for or open as some kind of potential floodgate? Um, once we, let's say we get to the end of this due process and they, they are allowed um, to remain here um, uh, as refugees, then aren't we now opening our shores to, 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 to a flood, so to speak, of, of Haitians seeking you know, a, a means of escaping their situation? Yes, and you know, I, I understand those concerns. Uh, and what I always like to do when faced with complex issues is to just go back to, to first principles. You know, first principles are, you know, like concepts like dignity and due process and procedural fairness. And these are such beautiful words because, you know, in the face of complexity, we just have to ask ourselves, um, what does the constitution require? And so, um, Yes, granting asylum to a group of people in this context could open up the floodgates, uh, as people would want to say. Um, but they've done it for other migrant groups. They, For Venezuelans fleeing persecution, they have established procedures where they can access territory and, you know, get access to humanitarian assistance. I have never once heard any argument about floodgates when it comes to Venezuelans. Uh, you know, when Ukrainians were fleeing persecution, um, the international community came together and put in place mechanisms. I didn't hear one argument about opening up the floodgates. And so I have to ask myself, why is it that when we seek to establish protections for certain people, uh, the floodgates argument comes up? But when we seek to establish protections for other people, you know, it is a sterling example of, you know, what the international community can do to protect human rights and all of these things. And so, um, you know, we just have to be careful about what the, the real issue is. Is it is the issue or concern about floodgates or is the, is our concern about something else? Yeah. Um, this might be an unfair question. I don't know if you've ever gone through what we were talking about before with a successfully or not, but how do you feel about the process? Uh, how do you feel speaking to us now? Do you think the Haitians will be granted asylum? You know, this is, this is a very difficult question for me because the decision is out of my hands and by every indication, there's nothing that I can count on and feel sure of. You know, the constitution and the rule of law are supposed to give you that certainty to say that no matter what happens, we have you know, a line that we will never cross. But unfortunately, what I'm seeing in Jamaica now is this continued disintegration in the rule of law. And so I feel like I'm in a, a state of free fall and I'm not sure where we we'll land. I don't know what is the limit of what, you know, state entities will do in terms of their, their willingness to retreat from the constitution and the rule of law. I don't know what path we're on and where that leads us. All I can say and all I can do is just urge the government in, in good faith and with all of the respect in the world to say, engage with us, you know, let us find a solution that's that's good and proper, because I think we inherently know what's right. You know, each human being, I think, has this innate ability to understand what is good and right and dignified. And what I can say is that by any standard and by any metric, how we're treating Haitians coming to our, store, our shores, it's not dignified, it's not good and proper, it's not fair. And so let, let's just do the right thing, you know. Let's stand with Haitian refugees, let's uphold international law, let's preserve our constitution, and let's just end this escalating cycle of migration-related abuse yeah. targeting Haitian migrants. The Haitians should be very happy that you're in their corner. I just pray that the right thing happens. Okay, guys, what did you think? Jamaica seriously said that the war in Haiti is diminishing, decreasing, but yet that's not what we're seeing. Like, if you look closely, even the Haitian 
prime minister or president, whatever they're called, he can't even return. They told him, do not return. Of Guyana, Irfan Ali, who is the chairman of the Caribbean Regional Group. Henry has been in Puerto Rico since last week after gang leaders controlling the capital warned him against returning to Port-au-Prince. Leaders of the Caribbean bloc CARICOM have been meeting in Jamaica's capital to discuss a political transition and the security crisis in Because Haiti. what they're going to do, they're going to end him. And now you're telling me you will send back people to a place, a country that doesn't have any president? Elsewhere, the Prime Minister of Haiti, Ariel Henry, has agreed to resign and make way for a tr transitional authority as his country wrestles with growing anarchy. He's been stuck in Puerto Rico, unable to return. U.S. officials say he's welcome to remain on U.S. soil if he wishes. Mr. Henry has held the unelected role since the assassination in 2021 of the country's last president. Can you imagine if we had this situation in Jamaica and we're going through those things? and no country wanted us. Even here in the Americas, when they go ahead and they interview all these people that comes through the border over there by Mexico, the ones that are from Cuba, they accept. The ones that are from Santo Domingo, they accept. The ones that are from Mexico, they accept. But once you identify yourself as Haitian, you are sent back. U.S. deported more than 5,500 Haitian migrants from the city of Dario in Texas. Like, I don't get it. The Haitians are our brothers and sisters, yet they're not giving a chance. Not even. I mean, with everything that's going on right now in Haiti, why should anyone try to prove themselves of their safety when their own president can't return? And you're willing to take in children that doesn't have their parents, orphans, but what about their parents? And you're willing to take in bank workers. What about the regular moms and dads, the regular grandfathers and grandmothers? I mean, guys, we have to do better as a people. And I'm not saying that, oh, we can take everyone because we don't know everyone's background, of course, the prison was broken into and all the criminals are out or most of them for that matter but i don't know we have to weigh our pros and cons and see what we can do because jamaica is like one of the closest places they can get to you know in the middle of the ocean because cuba how many cubans are going to accept them dr how many are going to accept them everybody can't go to the same places they have to merge out which is seriously sad Anyways, guys, go ahead and comment below. I know a lot of Jamaicans are going to say, oh, we don't want to eat Shan here or whatever. But guys, put yourself in their shoe. If Jamaica was going to the same issue, who would accept us? Anyways, please leave your comment below. Let me know what you guys truly think. Do you think Jamaica should accept some of them? Or do you think Jamaica should turn away all asylum seekers? It was 37 of them from last year. But then you found that they're not... You, they, they can't stay this year like you allow them to stay in the country almost a year and then you want them to return when Haiti got worse guys please leave your comment below let me know what you guys think know that Tony loves and appreciates you guys and there's more to come